Only recently have we begun to wonder about the minds of these awesome yet supremely graceful beings who have roamed the seas for millions of years before man's evolution. Having gained a position of dominance on this planet, we are discovering that we are not the center of life, but merely an element of an intricate ecosystem where each form of life is interdependent. In our need to justify our exploitation of all non-human life forms, we have conjured up a belief system which denies these creatures feelings, imagination and awareness. Yet the whales have brains that exceed ours in size and in areas that are known to function in thinking, perception, memory and conceptual thought. That there is an intelligence of another order on Earth, in the oceans, is now beginning to inspire those who have not been blinded by the traditional way of viewing nature. But the whales are vanishing. Since the 1920s, more than two million whales have been killed by commercial hunters, bringing five of the 10 species of great whales to the threshold of extinction. The whales were processed for use in the manufacture of commercial lubricants, fertilizers, mink feed, cooking fat compounds, pet foods, pharmaceutics, dynamite, crayons, soaps, and cosmetics. The Second World War offered a brief reprieve for the whales, as man turned his attention from killing whales to concentrate on the destruction of his own kind. Many whaling ships were converted to military use and destroyed in battle. 28 factory ships, including all of the Japanese boats, finished the war as battered hulks on the bottom of the seas. Japan's whaling fleet, by permission of General MacArthur's administration, is on the move again in the Antarctic. England, Norway, and Australia have protested, but American officials consider it an economic necessity. Fire she blows, or whatever it is the Japs say. Anyway, a whale's been spotted and the harpoon gunner gets set. Ready, aim, fire! End of Moby Dick. A special flag marks his carcass as the whalers go after another monster. The 100-pound harpoon is a wicked weapon. Its head explodes on impact with the whale, anchoring sharp pointed barbs in its hide. Six hundred yards of rope are drawn out in the wounded giant's death struggle. The whale hunt will help alleviate Japan's food shortage and ultimately save over $20 million for American taxpayers. Aboard the mothership, the whale is flensed or stripped of blubber. After its thick coat of fat is slid open, steam winches rip it off. Besides providing edible fat, blubber is used in making soap and fertilizer. Obviously, there's more to whaling than meets the eye. Last of all, much of the valuable catch is salted and packed as whale fillets for the long journey home. Not exactly porterhouse steak, but mighty welcome to a hungry nation. Representatives of 14 whaling nations formed the International Whaling Commission in 1946 to regulate the orderly development of the whaling industry. Each June, the IWC meets in London in this modern concrete high-rise to determine the fate of the last great whales. With an air of sophistication and civility, the delegates politely sit down together to carve up the whale pie. Today, the large pelagic whaling fleets are operated only by Russia and Japan, who together are responsible for more than 80% of the world's whale catch. The Japanese whaling industry argues that Japan needs whale meat to feed her protein-poor nation. However, the majority of whales killed are sperm whales, which are not eaten by anyone. The logic behind this destruction is purely economic. Extermination of the last whales will provide the maximum return on investment. 
Since the fleets are nearing retirement and their replacement is not a practical consideration, the whalers have decided to take as many whales as possible during the ensuing few seasons and are fully aware of the consequences. <coughs> the IWC has been little more than a front for the whaling companies. Mr. Iwao Fujita, Japan's delegate, is also a director of a major whaling company. So to expect the IWC to protect whales is like asking the wolves to guard the sheep. Uh, I'm sure the IWC has no powers of enforcement. Any member nation can exempt itself from any restriction merely by making a formal protest. The Commission has consistently set catch quotas which are even larger than the number the whalers are able to catch. The recommendations of its scientific committee are seldom adhered to. In 1949, the Commission was informed that the blue whales were in serious decline. But it took the IWC until 1967, 18 years later, to finally act upon these warnings. Now the blue whales, the largest creatures in the world, are so close to extinction that their recovery is in doubt. At the 1974 meeting of the IWC, the Mexican delegate made a final statement that if a 10-year moratorium was not introduced soon, this commission will be known to history as a small body of men who failed to act responsibly in the terms of a very large commitment to the world and who protected the interest of a few whalers and not the future of thousands of whales. Well, by about uh, 1975 in January, it was pretty clear that uh, the situation in terms of the survival of the whales had gone so badly downhill. No government seemed able to do anything about it. Uh, various conservation groups had been powerless to stop it. Um, so we decided what we needed was a workable plan. And, and the only workable plan we were able to come up with was to take a boat and go right out in the ocean and against whatever odds uh, we had to face, find a whaling fleet. And then we would take some inflatable rubber boats with outboard engines called Zodiacs and put people in them and then drive out right in front of the harpoon so that the harpooner wouldn't have a shot at the whale without having to go through or blast apart um, that human shield that had finally gotten up and, and got in the way and said, no, it's time to stop. The man who came forward to get us out on the Pacific was John C. Cormack, um, a veteran who's been up and down the West Coast longer than most of the people on the crew had been alive. And we had worked with him before uh, trying to stop uh, nuclear tests in the Pacific. So we knew John's judgment, we knew he was one of the real living old sea lions of the West Coast, and if anybody could get us, get us out there and find the fleets, it would be John. A younger but uh, equally essential crew member was a Czechoslovakian named uh, George Karotva, who was experienced both as a seaman, a captain in his own right, and as a radio operator. Uh, in addition, he'd been arrested in Czechoslovakia uh, during the uprising and taken by the Russians and put in a Siberian uh, camp for several years before he escaped. And, and during that time, he learned to speak fluent Russian. So that if we intercepted the Russians, at least we would have someone on board who could tell them what we were going to do. Grab the boat. Objection! 